All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Comp 3430 Operating Systems. The, uh, the attendance in this class fluctuates wildly from, uh, from Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday to Thursday. And I have a sneaking suspicion that it's related to Rob requiring attendance in software engineering. I have a sneaking suspicion that it might be related to that, maybe. Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe people just get tired of me after one day and just don't want to come back. Let's, uh, let's talk about operating systems. Today, we are going to spend time talking about threads, critical sections, and locks. We're going to leave the world of processes behind from the perspective of we're going to be using processes. We're going to be thinking about processes in terms of how to compare them to threads, but we're not really going to be doing any more process stuff. We're not going to be doing any more IPC stuff. Today, we're going to spend some time uh, looking more at uh, the use of threads in comparison to processes. And then we're going to look at some of the problems that come up with threads and how to deal with those in the form of critical sections and locks. Uh, before we get too far in today's class, um, I for office hours today, and, and just in general for office hours, uh, the, the way that I'm structuring it is basically like I just stay in the classroom until there's nobody asking me questions left, and then I go back up to my office and then finish office hours up there. Uh, today, I, I can't see people in my office. Nobody's come to see me in my office, in office hours, so I don't really think it's a big deal, but I, I can't stay in my office today. i got to go home to relieve my daughter's grandmother because my, she's still got this terrible ear infection, uh, and she can't go to daycare, and grandmas are scarce resources in my family, so I, I have to go home after, after class today. So if you have questions, please come right after class. Uh, just come up and talk to me. Um, but otherwise, I can see you tomorrow um, to talk about stuff. All right. So by the end of today's lecture, what I am looking for you to be able to do is continuing. I'm looking for you to be able to compare and contrast processes, threads, and then applications. Today, we're going to be looking at processes and threads from the perspective of the relative cost of creating these concurrent units of work. So how much does it cost to create a process versus how much it costs to create a thread? And we really want to think about that in two places. One is how much is the operating system doing in terms of like how much it has to do, just like how many instructions does it have to run to duplicate a process versus creating a new thread within a process? And similarly, how much memory is used in the process of, in the process of during creating a new process versus creating a new thread. That's the context of what we're looking at here. I want you to be able to identify the critical sections requiring mutually exclusive access to a piece of code that will be run concurrently using threads. I'm just going to like cover this up with my hand right now. We're only looking at threads today. We're not talking about processes in this context, just threads. I want you to be able to write code that uses pthread mutex lock to protect a critical section. So this is going to be one activity where we're doing this together. We're identifying critical sections and then trying to protect the critical section from concurrent access. And finally, I want you to be able to begin to identify correct and important and incorrect implementations that attempt to protect a critical section. And that's related to writing code that uses pthread mutex lock. So if we add locks to certain places in code, does it actually guarantee mutual exclusion? Does it actually guarantee that the code is going to produce the output that we're expecting to get uh, if it's running concurrently? This is beginning because next week you're going to be looking at this from the implementation of a lock perspective. So we're looking at the usage of locks today. Next week you're looking at, from, looking at it from the perspective of actually implementing a lock and building a lock. So our first, uh, our first exercise, our first activity here is uh, how much does creating a thread cost? And the way that I want to look at this is both in terms of how long does it take to create a thread, so how much time, how much clock time are we looking at, 
and then sort of indirectly how many cycles are involved in that in a CPU, and how much space. We're not going to measure memory usage today, but I'm going to get you to think about this just in terms of what we've thought about with regards to the process control block, what's in the process control block, what's shared between threads in a process control block, how much use of memory is going to change based on creating a new process from an existing one versus adding a new thread to an existing process. So I've got five options here. And I'm going to ask for your feedback just based on what you know, just based on what you know about process control block from the textbook, from the class that we've done in yesterday. I want us to compare processes to threads. And I'm going to ask you to show me with your fingers, with your fingers, what the relative cost is for creating a process versus creating a thread. So here we've got very little cost. It costs less than processes to create a thread. Medium cost, it's about the same as processes to create a thread. High cost, more than processes to create a thread. Very high cost, way more than processes to create a thread. Or it's uh, 10, 10 bucks, 10 bucks, or it's 10 bucks. Given what you know about process control blocks, given what you know about what's in process control blocks, given what you know about what is in an address space, given what you know about what's shared between threads within the context of a single process, show me, think about this, show me, there's no wrong answer here by the way, there's no wrong answer here because we haven't done any experiments yet, but no wrong answer. Show me by show of fingers what you think the cost is in terms of creating a thread versus creating a process. Take 10 seconds, think about it, or stick your fingers up immediately. Okay, so lots of ones, lots of twos, good, okay. What about in space, in memory usage? Take 10 seconds. OK, still lots of ones and twos. Good, good, OK. This is a thought exercise, but I would like to actually take the time to, to run an experiment, at least for calculating CPU time differences between creating threads and creating processes. In terms of memory usage, like I said, what I'm looking for here is for you to use your knowledge of process control block and then thread control block, what the differences between those two things are, and uh, what's involved in duplicating those things uh, to, to, to make that decision. Uh, I've got an example here that's called thread cost. Is that big enough at the back? Are you OK to see that? OK. This is an example called thread cost. This is posted to the course webpage right now. So if you want to follow along with this experiment, either on your own machine or on Aviary, you are more than welcome to. If you're running this on your own machine on Linux or on uh, Mac OS or on WSL, the Windows subsystem for Linux, uh, I'm going to be using a program that's called Hyperfine to run the experiments. So if you don't have that on your machine right now, you can install it, take the time to install it. It is already installed on Aviary. It wasn't as of three hours ago, but now it is. So you can use this on Aviary if you want to. Uh, I'm told that Michael Zapp used this in 2140. If you took 2140 recently, you wouldn't have taken it this last term. No, you wouldn't have taken it this last term because you're all third year and fourth year students. So why would you have taken it just last term? Okay. I'm told Michael Zapp used this before, and that's completely irrelevant to the conversation. Here's my program. The program that I'm going to show you is, is, is slightly different. I made a slight change to it from what I posted up on the course web page, but the context is still the same. I want to step through it. And uh, it's kind of a, a little bit of a mess of preprocessor directives. And I want to step through it. I want to run it through the compiler 
to give you an idea of what it looks like after the preprocessor directives have been applied. And then I want to actually compile it and start running it and make comparisons between these things. So I've got a couple of preprocessor variables that I am using to make decisions about how much is going to be run in each of these. So threads here is going to be how many concurrent things are going to be created. So whether they are threads or processes, how many times am I going to call pthread create? How many times am I going to call fork? Use processes and use threads here is a kind of a Boolean flag that says either use fork or use pthread create and then switch based on what you are being compiled with. Do nothing here is a function that matches the pthread create signature. It's a void pointer of return type, except a void pointer as an argument, but it does nothing. It just casts that void argument to void, so it's used so that we don't get that uh, compile time error, and then it just immediately returns null. In the main function, what I've got is uh, a couple of different malloc's. One is creating PIDs, and the other one is creating P threads. That initial part is kind of outside of what we're measuring in terms of time, because it's not the thing that's going to run a bunch of times. The overall idea here is that in a loop, I've got a loop here. In this loop, I'm going to repeatedly call pthread create, or I'm going to repeatedly call fork. So I'm going to call pthread create a thousand times, and then see how long it takes for this program to run. The worker does nothing. It doesn't do anything, so there's no extra work there, in theory. I'm going to call fork a thousand times. The child process, if it is a child process, will just immediately return. It will not do any work. It will just exit and do nothing. The parent process will just keep forking, keep forking, keep forking, keep forking a thousand times. The change that I've made, uh, if you're looking at this code on uh, what's on UM Learn, the change that I've made here is that I'm keeping track of the PIDs and in the version that's on UM Learn, I'll update this after class, but the version that's on UM Learn right now, I'm not keeping track of the PIDs. I just have fork in the conditional statement. The difference that I was trying to account for was the program also needs to wait for all of those things to finish. We must wait for them all to finish if we want to calculate how long it took to create them all, because otherwise it's just going to spin through that loop and then immediately exit. And that's measuring how fast it can go through the loop, not how fast those tasks take to be created. I added this, I want to keep track of the PIDs, because with P threads, I was waiting on them in the order that they were created. So I was waiting for P thread 0 to finish, then P thread 1, then P thread 2, then P thread 3. Whereas the example that I had uh, have on the course web page is just wait null. And wait null is wait for any child to finish. I don't care which one it is, just wait for any child to finish. With wait pid here, I am waiting for child 1, then child 2, then child 3. I want to make sure to, to reduce the number of variables as much as possible here in terms of uh, the comparison between the two of them. Full disclosure, this of course is not a perfect experiment. There's other stuff that's running on my machine, like OBS is running right now. I've got a web browser that's running right now. I've got other terminals that are running right now on this machine. There's other stuff running on this machine that may like affect the results that we're going to get. But Hyperfine uh, as a program, this is a tangent, Hyperfine is not part of the course curriculum, but Hyperfine is like, it will take this program and just run it and rerun it and rerun it and rerun it. And it runs it a bunch of times to try and do an, ex an experiment, a proper experiment, to reduce those like extra variables that are outside the scope of this code. So this is kind of a mess of preprocessor directives. I'm going to use Clang uh, to, compile, to compile this code. I'm going to pass uh, some D values, so some uh, preprocessor directives excuse me, preprocessor variables there, but I'm using this dash E flag on Clang, and that says just run the preprocessor, do not compile the code, just rerun, pre, run the prepro, gosh, just run the preprocessor, just run the preprocessor, 
and spit out the code back in C again. So it's just spitting out C code. So if I want it to use threads, it spits out a lot here. It spits out a lot. I'm going to run this into, can I do this? Nah, I can't do that. I'm going to pipe it into less. So it spits out a lot. It spits out a lot. All these includes that you have at the top of your source code are getting dumped into your program here, which is a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that gets dumped into here. So I'm going to go to the bottom. This is the program that, uh, that just does threads. So it malloc's pthreads. It's got this loop that runs through a thousand times, and it waits a thousand times, and then exits. That, that's all this is doing. The same thing with use processes. At the bottom here, it calls fork, it calls malloc, it calls wait a bunch of times. So this is just stripping all that extra stuff out and kind of demonstrating what the two programs are actually going to look like when you compile them. If you download this code, I've got a readme in here, by the way. And I try to put a readme in every sample that I put up just to give you an idea how to run it uh, so you don't have to spend like an hour watching a video to see just how I did it. Um, but this is a good description of how to, uh, how to compile and run this program. So let's actually try this. I'm going to start uh, by making clean. I'm going to make clean. And then I'm going to make something that uses one thread, and then I'm going to make something that uses one process. I want to make that comparison between the two of them. So I'm going to say make type uh, use processes threads here one concurrent thing. I want one call to fork to happen. I'm going to move thread cost to thread cost one. So I've, I've, I just want to keep these binaries around. I want to keep these programs around so that I can run hyperfine on them. I'm going to make, I'm going to say use threads. Threads is equal to 1. And I'm going to move thread cost to uh, thread cost.threads.1. So in my directory, I've got two programs. I'm going to run them with hyperfine now. Hyperfine takes two arguments, which is the two programs that you want it to run to make comparisons to each other. So I'm going to say thread cost.processes and thread cost.threads.1. And just before I hit enter, just before I hit enter, I want to go back to my slide here and I want you to think about this again. What your answer was for this, think about what your answer was for this in terms of how much time. And we're using time as an approximator for CPU cycles here to get a sense of uh, what your thought was and what we're actually making observations about. OK, so we're all ready? Good. We're buckled in. It exited with a non zero status code. Oh, no. That was thread cost dot. Threads. Why did it exit with a non-zero exit code? Seems to exit with just a fine exit code. Let me try this again. Oh, you know what? My mistake. I didn't put the dot slash here. It's not on my path, so I have to put dot slash. OK, so threads ran 1.27 times faster than processes. But I, wanna, I really want to note this, plus or minus 1.43. That is not that is not a solid conclusion. That's not a solid conclusion at all. So let's, uh, let's try this again. Uh, let's try it with, um, should we do 10 or 100? What do you think? 100, OK. So let's do 100. Move thread cost to this is threads and it's 100. I'm going to make again, use processes. And I'm going to move that thread cost to uh, processes.100. Let's run hyperfine one more time here, but with 100 for threads and 100 for processes. Uh, 
All right, so threads is 1.93 plus or minus 0.62 times faster than processes. Okay, uh, I'm gonna read this thing that's spitting this out at me. The command took less than five milliseconds to complete. The results might be inaccurate because Hyperfine cannot calibrate the shell startup time much more precise than this limit. So you can try to use dash n or shell equals none to disable the shell completely. So that kind of implies that Hyperfine is using, uh, so you, you may have read the system system call, system system call. System as a system call is invoking the shell to run stuff. Uh, it's similar to fork and then exec, except it's asking the operating system to make a new shell so that the shell can do fork and exec, which is kind of weird. I'm gonna run uh, dash n here and let's make sure that that is true. So yeah, it's still consistent with what we saw just a second ago. I'm gonna spin up here to, uh, I think I'm gonna spin up to 10,000 processes and threads. So this is 10,000 processes. And I'm gonna make it again with threads. And I'll run Hyperfine one last time here. 10,000. 10,000. So we're calling fork 10,000 times, we're calling pthread create 10,000 times, and then we're waiting for all of those things to finish. This, uh, this specific example, if you go up to 10,000, if you're trying to run this on aviary, it may not run on aviary. It may not actually run on aviary because there are limits to the number of um, processes that you're allowed to run at any given time on aviary. I don't have that limit on my system, Threads ran 1.84 plus or minus 0 0.06 times faster than processes. I, I think that's a pretty definitive answer here. I think that's a pretty definitive answer here. I do want to point out some other items of interest here. Processes and threads, we see these measurements of user time versus system time. These are those two modes. These are those two modes, our user mode and our system mode, our operating system mode. The threads version spent way less time in our user mode than our processes version did. The amount of time that was spent in user mode here also seems to be higher than the, the mean time and also seems to be higher than the max time that this thing ran for, which is kind of weird, it's kind of weird. The user time that's being calculated here is being calculated across all of the processes that were created, all of the processes that were created. There's only one process here, and most of the time is being spent uh, creating all these threads. Most of the time is being spent created, creating all these threads. So that, that's kind of to ex like hand wavy explain what's going on there. All right. So are we okay this? We, we, I, I think, you know, I saw lots of ones and lots of twos. I think this confirms that lots of ones and lots of twos. I think that the cost to create threads seems to be lower than the cost to create processes. It seems to be lower than the cost to create processes. I'm going to go back to my slides here. Threads are not free. They're, they seem to be faster. They seem to be faster to create. They are cheaper to create than processes. Maybe, maybe. I think that the answer that we've got from Hyperfine says, yeah, they probably are cheaper to create than processes. What I would like to do is uh, take a look at what is actually happening when we call these two functions. I have intentionally used the word function here now. P 
pthread create is a function. There, there's no getting around that. That's a function that comes from the pthreads library, which is part of the standard library that we're using on something like Linux. Fork, though, I, I've been calling it a system call. I've been calling it a system call this whole time. I've been calling fork a system call. On, on Linux, so specifically on Linux, fork is not a system call. It was a system call, and it sort of still is a system call, but the fork that we're calling is it's not a system call. I want to take a look at what each of these things are doing. And the way that I'm going to take a look at that is using this program that's called strace. strace is a program that traces system calls that are being made by a program. This is a tool that you can use for uh, determining what system calls are being blocked on, like read and, and write. That would be a helpful debugging tool if you're working on something that uses read and write a lot. It would be a helpful debugging tool for that. The manual page for strace tells me that uh, it's for tracing system calls and signals. There's a lot of stuff that's in here. But the one thing that I want to do is uh, very quickly take a look at an option that's on uh, this program that's called dash e, which is I want to filter based on an expression. And I want to go a little bit further down, a little bit further down to here. And I want to take a look at this filtering option. This lets me filter by specific system calls. And then it also lets me filter by specific groups of system calls. So things like file and process and, and network. It lets me take a look at what system calls are being made based upon some kind of grouping of uh, system calls. I want to do process. I want to do the process set of system calls. So I want to see what's happening with fork. I want to see what's happening with wait. I want to see what's happening with whatever is happening with uh, pthread create. So let's take a look at that. I've got a bunch of programs here. I'm going to stick to the one versions. Otherwise, we're going to get like gobs of output. And I don't want to see gobs of output right now. If I run just strace, on uh, thread cost processes dot one, I get a, a lot of output, a lot of output. These are all of the system calls that this program made. I want to do s trace dash e trace equals percent process. So I just want to see things that are related to process management. So we've got exec ve that is being run. ExecVE is being run on this program. This ExecVE, that was our shell running ExecVE just after it forked, just after it forked. So the shell forked, and then it ran ExecVE, which is it's, it's like ExecVP, but it just environment instead of, uh, well, I don't remember what the P stands for. It's not important right now. This is just after our shell has forked, and it has it never calls fork. Okay, so it never calls fork, but it instead calls clone. Clone on Linux, on Linux, on Linux, on Linux. Clone is the system call that's being made to duplicate your PCB. The standard library, we still got fork. You write fork, but it ultimately gets translated into clone with all of these different arguments. And there's a couple things that I'll note about this. It's talking about a stack. Okay, that's that's one kind of interesting thing. It's talking about TID PTR. So PTR pointer, ID identifier, T thread. Thread, thread, okay, but this was processes. This was processes. And we've got wait, but it's it's actually turned out to be wait four, which is uh wait pid, sorry. This was wait pid that we called, but it's turned out to be wait four instead of just wait. That part is less interesting. But what we can see with this is that when we're using strace, the arguments that are being passed to these functions are actually 
they're resolved, they're printed out for you so you can see what those arguments are. So when I called wait PID, the process that was created had a process ID of 1126797. Okay, so that's, that's our processes version. Let's try the same thing, but with threads. So here's that exec VE, our shell forked, and then it called exec VE on the program name that we passed to it. And then it calls clone. It's like clone with a different number, but it's still calling clone. And there's a bunch of arguments that are being passed in this flags thing. So we've got flags up here in our first call to clone. We've also got flags here in our second call to clone, but there's a bunch of interesting stuff that's added to it here. Clone thread, clone files, fs, fs is file system here, vm, vm is virtual memory. Okay, so threads are within this same shared address space, virtual memory. So this clone system call is taking an argument that says, hey, I should duplicate duplicate that virtual memory. I should maybe reuse the same virtual memory. There's child TID, so that's some opaque thing. There's parent TID, we did not have that here, but here we're making a thread. We don't have anything that looks like wait, it just exits. We definitely called pthread join. We were asking to wait for that thing to finish, but there's no wait. Which is, uh, that's actually a little bit counterintuitive to me that threads are, well, maybe it explains something, that threads could be a little bit faster because we're not really waiting for them to finish at the system level. We're not making quite as many system calls. So we're not doing quite as many mode switches to go into the OS and wait for something to happen. With wait there, we were explicitly switching to the OS mode and waiting for that thing to happen. We blocked until that thing finished. All right. So in terms of comparing processes and threads, we're now able to make some observations about, yeah, threads do seem to be faster. They do seem to be faster. That's, that's good. They seem to be faster to create. Let me, let me qualify that. They're faster to create than to create another process. We're still just running instructions, so we're not like making the instructions go any faster, but threads do seem to be faster to create. There's some confounding stuff here. Like I said, there's an extra system call that's happening in this process version that's not happening in the threaded version. And that might account for some differences between the performance, but I don't think that it's two times performance. That was our outcome from Hyperfine is it's almost two times faster. And it doesn't seem to be that one system call out of a bunch would make up for two times the difference of execution. I'm gonna pause here, any questions? Okay, all right. So I'm gonna switch back to my slides. The last thing I really wanna say here about what the, relationship between, the, what the relationship is between processes and threads is this idea of con containment or ownership. In terms of how, how I describe threads and processes to people, a process is something that has one or more threads of execution. So the relationship here is like one contains the other. A single process can have many threads of execution. A thread of execution belongs to a specific process. It belongs to a specific process. A process is 
uh, uh, I used this analogy after everyone left last class, and I, I thought it was too good to, to not say again. So a process now is kind of like a house, and the threads are like the people in the house. When you call fork on a process, you're duplicating the house. Uh, the threads of execution are the people that live inside the house. They're doing stuff inside the house, but the, the house itself is not doing anything. It doesn't do anything. It just exists to contain the people. And the looks on your faces tell me that was not a good analogy. So, okay. Uh, process contains threads of execution. A process has threads of execution. All right, so I would like to switch to doing something a little bit more, um, a little bit more active on your part. I have uh, I've printed out a bunch of copies of this code. So I handed some out before class. Uh, this is also on the course webpage. If you didn't get a copy of this and you want a copy, please just come up and grab one. I'll put them over here. If you want to copy, um, it is up on the course webpage though. So if you don't want to uh, to have a physical piece of paper, no problem. You can just uh, use the PDF that's up there. There's a bunch of code fragments on this handout, and what I'm really looking for us to do is to try and make some decisions, and I want to step through these one by one. For each code fragment, I want us to make a decision. Is there or is there not a critical section in this code if it were to be run concurrently by several threads at the same time? Is it possible for there to be some kind of an issue between multiple threads of execution executing this code at the same time? That's a binary yes or no. Is there a critical section in this code? Then I want to ask, where is the critical section in the code? And once we've got a decision about where the critical section is in the code, make a decision about how to fix it. How do we get it to produce the expected output? So decide where we should put locks. Use pthread mutex lock to protect the critical section. I want to do that for some of these. Like, I'm going to write the code to do it. I'm not going to do that for all of these. I want to answer questions like, where do we initialize the lock? And where do we place the lock? How do we acquire and release the lock? And if a critical section doesn't exist, I want us to be able to explain why there is no critical section. I'm going to pop up my tablet here. And uh, the very first one that we're going to look at, if I can get this to zoom in without being too big, the very first example that I want to look at is this one. This is an example that comes from the textbook. This is an example that is in the textbook. The first question that I want us to answer together is yes or no, this contains, contains a critical section or does not contain a critical section. And if you were lucky enough to get a lumpy space princess, this is what we're going to use for you to tell me if there is a critical section here or not. If there is a critical section, I'm going to give you time to read this code, like a minute, because it's a really short piece of code. If there is a critical section, Lumpy Space Princess is not happy, is not happy. This is what I want you to show me if you think there is a critical section in this code. If there is not a critical section in this code, Lumpy Space Princess is satisfied and happy. And I will not do the Lumpy Space Princess voice because I would embarrass myself if I tried. So take. Take one minute, take one minute. I'm putting 60 seconds on my timer. Don't show me Lumpy Space Princess yet. After the one minute has elapsed, then lift up your Lumpy Space Princess. No wrong answers. Don't feel bad if you didn't quite get it. Please go ahead. Also, feel free to talk to people if you want to.
All right, show me your lumpy space princesses. A angry, angry means critical section. There is a critical section in this code. Happy is no critical section. Okay, okay, we are mostly angry. That's good. That's good. That's great. Lumpy space princess. Okay, so I printed these out. I printed these out because I did comp 2150 last term and also comp 3350. And I could have used this in comp 3350, but I used it in comp 2150. And that's because we talk initially there about the Liskov substitution principle. And every time we talk about Liskov subs, every time I think about Liskov substitution principle, I think LSP, the Liskov substitution principle. And okay, how many people have watched Adventure Time? Wow, I saw. Oh, huh. okay. So homework after this after this course is over. After this course is over, to watch Adventure Time, Lumpy Space Princess. There's a lot of princesses in uh, in Adventure Time, and there's Finn and Jake, and Jake is <laughs> Jake the dog and Finn the human. Jake is this dog that can go around and talk and like, it's like a magic dog basically is like limbs that just go all over the place. And uh, there's, a, there's a lot of princesses in this show and Lumpy Space Princess is one of them and she lives in Lumpy Space. Okay, I've gone on too far. Um, good, yes, there is a critical section in this code. Stick up your hand if you are comfortable telling me where, where this is. Where is the critical section? Yeah. On line nine? Yeah. There's two parts to this. There's two parts to this critical section. Where's the other part of the critical section? You're pointing up, and I'm going to interpret that you're referring to this. Yes? Yeah. OK, good, good. This was our textbook example. The critical section here is that this is a statement. This is a statement. Plus, plus is a statement. It is not add. It's not add. It is increment. Increment is. Three instructions, load, add, store, load, add, store. If this function were to have two different threads running at the same time, at the same time, we might get interrupted in the middle of any of those three instructions. After one is completed, we may be interrupted. Another thread will start running, and it will make changes to this file scoped variable. For this specific example, I'm going to load up this code on my screen right now. So I've got threads.c here. Here is that code. I've modified it just a little, just a little bit. I have changed the hard-coded uh, million here to be a preprocessor directive called up to, but this is otherwise unmodified. This is exactly the same example. I'm going to zoom out here. I'm going to go uh, to the same folder in my other directory. I'm going to make this. I'm going to run threads. And every time I run threads here, there are some interestingly different outputs from my main function. Sometimes after the threads is launched, they've already started before the main process, the main thread of execution can start printing stuff out. And that counter has already been incremented by just a little bit. But the important part is, that the counter never gets to be what it was supposed to be. We're never getting to that point of what we wanted it to be. So my next question here is, if the problem, if the critical section here is that we've got counter plus plus and counter is equal to zero, de declaring and defining this variable outside the scope of this function, if that's our critical section, where do we place the locks? So where do we stop multiple threads of execution from entering code? Where do we initialize the locks? Where do we place them? Where do we acquire the lock? Where do we release the lock? I'm going to give you 10 seconds. This was a textbook example. This was a textbook example. Take 10 seconds to think about where we would need to acquire a lock, just acquire a lock, and release a lock to prevent this from uh, having multiple entries into the critical section, 
and to make sure that we get the expected outcome. Just keep it in your head, and then I'll work through it with you. All right. So our critical section here is entirely, entirely related to counter here being a shared resource. It is a shared resource across multiple threads of execution. And we are trying to make changes to that shared resource across multiple threads of execution. Let's go back to this code. And what I'm going to do is uh, first, I'm going to open up the manual page for pthread uh, mutex, pthread mutex lock. pthread mutex lock, this is a combination of two things. There is a lock object. This is the thing that will be locked and released. So like physical lock, you're locking the door behind you once you go into a shared place and you are unlocking it after you are finished with that shared place. It also consists of function calls to acquire the lock. I'm going to lock it and prevent things from accessing this and unlocking the lock. I want to allow other things to have access to this again. pthreads have uh, a couple of predefined mutexes. You can use this init function to, to initialize a mutex, but it's far easier to just use one that exists already rather than initializing it. There are also different kinds of mutexes that can be helpful in certain circumstances. The difference between mutex initializer, recursive mutex initializer, and error check mutex initializer is that Mutex is just a dumb mutex. That's it. It prevents multiple things from acquiring the same lock. Recursive says, if the same thread of execution tries to acquire me, great. That's totally fine. If the same thread of execution tries to acquire me, I will allow it. The same thread of execution must unlock me the same number of times that it has locked me. And this is useful in places where you've got recursion, where you're like recursing down a tree structure. Error check mutex initializer is significantly slower to use than the other two because it tries to identify situations like deadlock, which is what we'll talk about tomorrow. It tries to identify these situations and then tell you that you have entered a deadlock I'm going to bail out now and just stop executing. Mutex initializer, just that bare word, just doesn't do any of that stuff. And that's what we're sticking with for now. So I'm going to initialize my mutex outside the function, outside of the function. So pthread mutex t lock. And I'm going to say that that's equal to pthread mutex initializer. Spelled that correctly? Yes, I have spelled that correctly. I have spelled that correctly. I'm putting this outside of the function because it must be shared by all of the threads of execution that are going to use it. I am putting it outside the lock, outside the function, as opposed to putting it inside the function. I do not want this to be a stack variable because that stack is local to each thread. That would be kind of like You've got a door, but everybody has their own doorknob that they can just open if they want to. And it doesn't prevent access to that shared resource. So I'm putting it outside the function. When I want to acquire the lock, I'm going to do this in two ways. The first one is, this is the critical section. That's the critical section. It's the critical section. Look, I highlighted in yellow. That's the critical section. I'm going to uh, acquire the lock here. So I'm going to say pthread mutex lock. And I have to pass a pointer to that mutex that I want to lock. It's going to make changes to it, so I have to pass a pointer. I'm going to increment it, load add store. And I'm going to guarantee that nobody else has access to that. 
And then I'm going to do pthread mutex unlock. Once I acquire the lock, I must release it or nobody will be allowed to use it again. Nobody will be allowed to enter there. In terms of the words that we have seen before, pthread mutex lock is a blocking function. It's a function that blocks. If the lock has already been acquired by somebody else, the thread that's trying to get it will just sit there and wait. It will be woken up when the thread is uh, the thread that had previously had it unlocks it, so it's allowed to enter it. But pthread mutex lock will block if the lock is already held by somebody else. Okay, let's make this and make sure that I haven't misspelled anything. I have not. Good. And I'm going to run it now. Okay, good. That's great. That's actually fine. I'm going to start making this a little bit bigger. I don't want it to be just a million. I'm going to make it a lot bigger. I'm going to make, I'm going to run it again. Okay. It finished. I'm going to run time here. Time is another command to measure the time that something takes to run. And while this is running, I'm going to do something slightly different. I'm going to take lock acquisition, and I'm going to move it here outside the loop. And I'm going to take unlock, and I'm going to put it here outside the loop. So this inside the loop takes seven seconds to finish. Lots of time. It takes seven seconds to finish to count up to what is this? That's thousands, hundred thousands. So it counts up to 200 million right now. It counts up to 200 million. It takes about seven seconds to count up to 200 million. I'm going to run this again. And uh, now it takes 400 milliseconds to count up to 20 million. OK, so the difference between these two is that they are both correct implementations. They are correct implementations of where we should place this lock. They are both correct. They are both producing what the expected output is. They're both producing 200 million as their output. The critical section only ever has one thread of execution running in it at any given time. We can guarantee that. These are both correct implementations. One is obviously significantly faster than the other and more performant. This approach here, we've got to acquire the lock and release the lock 200 million times, 200 million times. So we're calling this function lock 200 million times. We're calling this function unlock 200 million times. Here, we're calling the function lock two times, two times, one per thread. And we're calling the function unlock two times, one per thread. This is now a serial program. It's serial. It's no longer concurrent. These are not running at the same time anymore. This is like thread one runs to, to full completion, and then thread two runs to completion, as opposed to like switching back and forth between the two of them. But that's OK. That's OK in this case. That's OK in this case, because it's still way faster than allowing those threads to switch back and forth between each other. OK, so lock placement. I've put the lock itself, I've declared the lock outside the function. I can't put it inside the function. Let's put it inside the function. If I put this inside the function here, and I'm going to put the lock back in this placement. If I put this inside the function, and I make it, and I run it, it's both really slow and wrong. It's both really slow and wrong because each thread has its own lock that it's locking and releasing. So when we have this shared critical section, we must put it outside the scope of what that thread is executing in. In terms of lock acquisition and lock release, this outside the loop and inside the loop, they are both correct implementations of a lock acquisition and release. One of them is way faster than the other, even if it is making it run in serial as opposed to in parallel. 
Are we okay with this? Yeah. So this is a, con that's a, that's a great question. This is a contrived example. The, the, the contrived example here is basically like, yeah, plus plus is a really easy to demonstrate. There's stuff going wrong with threads here. We're going to look at, if you've looked ahead, we're going to look at like list insertion and stuff a little bit later. And that's less contrived of an example than doing stuff with a simple counter. The benefit of doing things in serial versus in parallel, it, it actually kind of depends on what you're trying to accomplish. So it's, you know, it's worth experimenting and building things that are serial first is a lot easier than trying to build something that's parallel first and then go back to serial later. My answer, unfortunately, is kind of it depends on what, what it is that you're trying to build to decide whether or not you should be serial or parallel in the first place. Yeah. We're otherwise okay with this? Good, 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 good. Okay. We're all okay with this, Lumpy Space Princess. We're all happy. Good. Yes, good. I'm not going to do this whole uh, like implement with pthread locks every single time. This is the last time I'm going to do that. We're, th we're going to think about where do we put the locks, but I'm not going to do this anymore. We've got the idea of how to initialize a lock, how to call lock, how to acquire it, how to release it. I'm not going to do that anymore, but we will talk about where to put the locks. OK, so let's move on to the next example here. So I'm looking now at modified textbook sample A. I'm going to put uh, one minute again on my timer. The question that we are currently asking right now is, is there a critical section in this code or not? Please talk if you want to. You've got one minute to make that decision. OK, so Lumpy Space Princess, angry face, there's a critical section. Happy face, there is no critical section in this code. OK, OK, there is no critical section in this code. There's no critical section there. This code is uh, real similar to the last one. It's really, really similar to the last one. The expected output here is that counter is going to be the expected output in the last one. Let me say it this way. The expected output in the last one was that counter would be 20 million at the end. The expected output here is that there are two threads that have counted to 10 million, not 20 million anymore. If you're comfortable, if you're confident, stick your hand up. Why is there not a critical section in this code? Yeah. Since the counter is defined like in the function, so it's going to be on the stack. Yeah. Exactly. So this one is not a critical section because this variable has been declared as a stack variable. I'm going to write this down. You may, you may have seen this term somewhere before. This is not necessarily in the textbook, but you may have seen this word somewhere before, thread local. In this context, this variable counter is a thread local variable. Every thread of execution gets its own stack pointer. So when we call this function thread counter, 
It gets its own stack pointer and it gets its own stack. Counter is being declared on the stack of a thread of execution. So every thread of execution gets its own counter variable. So there's no critical section in this code. There's no critical section here. A, a common mistake that I've seen in the past, a common mistake in understanding, a common mistake in understanding that I've seen in the past is that some students will also look at the loop and kind of make the mistake and think that I is the thing that's the shared thing. But I here is the same as counter in this context. They're both stack allocated variables. So they're both going to be thread local. They're both thread local. So I'm just going to quickly annotate this. So critical section. I'm going to put CS here in parenthesis so that I don't have to write critical section each time. And here I'm going to write no CS. OK, good, excellent. Let's move to the next example here. So this is modified textbook sample B. Sorry for the like split between two lines on 5 and 6 there, but that's the same statement. I'm going to give you another one minute. This looks very, very similar to the last two. It's just a modification of that textbook sample. Decide if there's a critical section in this code. OK, so again, angry, angry space princess, there is a critical section. Happy space princess, there is no critical section in this code. Somebody's going like this. Somebody's going like this. <laughs> Somebody is showing me just the side of the paper, which I assume is the same thing. Yeah, OK. There is no critical section in this code. There is no critical section in this code. OK. I'll be, I will be very honest with you, this, this modified example, this is intentionally meant to be like a trick. I'm trying to trick you here. We've got an address space. We've got an address space. Whoops. Sorry about that. We've got an address space, and the address space has code. It's got heap. And now we have stack and stack and some other stack. Every thread is getting its own stack. Every single thread of execution gets its own stack. In this function, a thread of execution here is calling malloc. A single thread of execution is calling malloc. And it's got its own pointer to an int. malloc, I am going to assume here, I'm assuming that calling malloc itself is thread safe, it's OK for a thread of execution to call this. It will not be interrupted while it is allocating that memory dynamically. I'm going to assume that malloc has things like pthread lock in it. I'm going to assume that that's the case. 
This means that in the heap, we've got, I'm going to draw it like this. So this is my heap. We've got one malloc that's happening for thread one. And then we've got a separate malloc somewhere else in my heap space that's being made for thread two. Malloc is being called two times. So we're getting different addresses in the same virtual address space. So it's in the same heap, like in that same placement overall, but we're getting two different addresses back. One thread calls malloc, it gets its own place to put a single integer. The other one calls malloc, it gets its own separate place to put an integer. When we dereference these things, we're just referring to that different place in the heap to increment this by. Yeah, Aiden. The first reference is uh, if the memory output is yeah. the OS changing the base has the malloc or the OS itself. Yes. Yeah. And please go ahead. Oh, oops, I have this whole okay, I have this stuff left. Yeah. So each thread, I'm going to say it this way, each thread gets its own stack, but a process only has one heap. So there's many threads of execution in a single process, but there's only one heap. And there's only one, like, I'm keeping track of which parts of the heap have been allocated or not allocated yet. We're going to talk about that much more a little bit later, like actually going through the process of allocating and deallocating stuff on the heap and what that means. Uh, but for now, you can safely say that, yes, Within a single process with many threads, all of those threads share the same like allocated, not allocated structure for what the heap is. Yeah, that was a great question. Thank you. Any other questions? OK, so malloc here is an intentional red herring it's it's meant to distract us from what's actually going on but it doesn't actually make a difference there's there's no no critical section here because we're doing thread local stuff the pointer is thread local the allocation is for that thread specifically another thread is not going to get the same block as some other thread after we've called malloc OK, good. Let's move on. I'm going to move up here to uh, the top right corner. And in the top right corner, we've got our first list traversal function. So this is list traversal A that I'm looking at right now. I'm going to give you a minute and a half to look at this code. It's a little bit longer. It is different from what we were doing in the textbook. And we'll do the same decision-making process. Does this have a critical section? And if it does have a critical section, where would we add the locks? Please go ahead. Okay, 
Again, happy space princess, no critical section. Angry space princess, there is a critical section in this code. OK, so majority is no critical section. There is no critical section in this code, no CS. A, a common like indicator that there is a critical section, shared resources. There's a clear shared resource here. The clear shared resource is head. This is the clear shared resource in this example. But the other part of red flag for there's a critical section here is that there could be concurrent modification to that shared resource. In this case, We've got node cur is equal to head. Node cur is a stack or thread local variable. Head, that's definitely a shared resource, but we are never modifying head. We're never modifying head here. The expected output from this is that we would get the contents of this list printed out two times. We'd get it printed out two times. We can't guarantee the order of printing, like thread one might print the head, and then thread two might also print the head, or thread one might print four nodes, and then thread two prints the head. But the sum of it would be that all of the nodes get a chance to be printed out. We, we could make an argument, I guess, that standard output is like the critical section here, but I'm going to shut that down and say, no, that's not the critical section here. In this case, because cur is a stack or thread local variable, there's no critical section in this code. We OK with that? OK. OK, good. Thank you. Thank you for that. Let's go down to the list traversal B here. I'm only going to give you 30 seconds to read this code. This is almost identical to the last example. OK, critical section, angry space princess. No critical section, happy space princess. There is a definitely a critical section in this code. There is a critical section in this code. The critical section here is that we've now moved cur outside of our function. This is now a shared resource. Cur is a shared resource, and we are possibly making concurrent modifications to it. What's happening here is that thread one will start, and it will maybe print some stuff out, and then it will get suspended. And then thread two will start, and it will assign cur to head. And then it will get suspended. And thread two, thread one will start again. And it will just start printing at the start of the list again because of heads being a shared resource across these different nodes or across these different threads of execution. The outcome here is that it's unexpected output because we may have some nodes that are skipped or nodes that are like duplicated in ways that we weren't expecting them to be duplicated because cur is a shared resource. Yes. It's possible to get a null pointer here too, yes, because we could get to the end of the loop where cur is null, and then the next thread gets to start, but it's already in the loop after, yeah. So that's a good point. Let me say that again. It could be that thread one executes here, it gets back up to my loop, and it says cur does not equal null, and it enters the loop and is immediately suspended. The other thread then starts continuing, and it gets to the point of setting cur to null. 
then thread one gets back, and then it starts trying to print this out, and then it's trying to dereference a null pointer. So that's another case where this is a critical section. Thank you for pointing that out. That's a good, good catch. We are at 145. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to show this on the screen. We are going to look at this one very first thing tomorrow. Please, please take the time to look at it. Just take five minutes to look at it today, after class, at home, wherever, before class tomorrow. Just take the time to read it before we get to next class so that I can just start asking this question immediately. Does this have a critical section or not? This one is it's a lot trickier looking than what we were just looking at. There's stuff here that has to do with list creation specifically. Uh, but please take the time to look at it. I'm going to quickly summarize. Threads are an alternative current cur concurrency mechanism. They're cheaper maybe than processes. Threads are a part of a process. So when we are creating a new thread of execution, we're not duplicating the whole PCB. We're just adding a new thread control block, adding a new TCB to the PCB. They're different behavior than processes in the sense that they have shared virtual memory. They have a shared virtual address space. So making changes in one place affects the other threads of execution, whereas making changes in one place in a process doesn't really have any effects until we start thinking about inter-process communication. Multi-threaded code can have data races and critical sections. Locks and mutual exclusion can resolve those data races. We'll look back at the, uh, the list example to look at where the locks should go next class two tomorrow. Um, and lock placement can affect performance. So putting it inside the loop was way, way slower than putting it outside the loop. That's it. Thank you for giving me two minutes, and I will see you all tomorrow. Bye, everybody.